my name's Matt. Welcome back to the shop. And today, um, someone sent me an email asking me a question. Um, and I said we'd eventually get into this. And I was talking to a friend the other day about this, Tim. And uh, I just thought I'd pass him. Motherfucker. <laughs> Start that again. My name's Matt, welcome back to the shop, and we're going to get back into a bit more theory and stuff. I said I'd broach this subject um, later on, and I thought we'll just start to tease the subject out a bit, and that is the subject about diesel engines. And someone asked me this question, what is the main difference between them? I don't understand, can you give me an idea, blah, 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 blah. And because of that, I thought, oh, fuck it, you know, I'll go onto YouTube and type in what the difference is between diesels. And there's a Kilmer video and an Engineering Explained video and a Car World video, all this kind of rubbish. And there's loads of videos of what are the difference between the two. The difference between the two, the real difference between the two, I could not find, right? No one's done a video on this or no one's making it blatantly clear what the difference is. And the difference is really quite interesting. So, um, when I start getting into diesel stuff, one of the main things I want to start with is the story of the history of how diesels came about. So we'll go very briefly into that right now. Um, so there's a guy called um, Otto. So you might have heard of the Otto cycle, stuff like that. There's the Carnot cycle and blah, 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 blah. And it goes on. And... Um, Basically, this guy in 1860, 1850, 1860 something, Otto basically was a German engineer, built the first demonstration of the first um, four stroke gasoline engine, even though he didn't use gasoline, he used coal dust, but anyway, um, it's like I say, it's a cool story. Anyway, several years later, um, a guy called Rudolf Diesel. Uh, was born in fucking hell, born in France um, with a name like that, which is awesome. Uh, he patented or tried to put in a patent for the diesel engine, his engine. And uh, Otto and some other guys and stuff basically contended this. They said you just copied our design. Now, if I said to you. Um, you know, what are the differences between diesel and uh, petrol? You would say, well, it's spark ignition versus compression ignition. Eh, it doesn't always have to be. Um, you'd also then say, oh, well, it's, you know, direct injection. Well, gasolines now have direct injection, so it's not that either. Um, a lot of people would say it's the fuel. Well, diesels can actually run on kerosene, bloody all sorts. Um, you know, chip fat oil, bloody, fucking anything. So it's not specifically for the fuels. You can run petrols on stuff like xylene and uh, acetone mixes, stuff like that. You can run them on ethanol. You can run them on methanol. It's not basically fuel that gives these, you know, otherwise you don't, we do call them petrol engines, we do call them diesel engines, just for simplicity. That's the way English goes a lot of the time. Um, so there, dude. Yeah. And, you know... That's not the difference, you know what I mean? The difference is actually a very fundamental difference. And like I said, this is the thing that I haven't found on any other videos. I just, because I was going to send the guy to another video. But I thought, no, fuck it, let's do it. So the main... Diesel, it's just like it's appropriate-ish. So there's... Basically, a fundamental difference between petrols and diesels, and this is what Rudolf Diesel argued in a nutshell, and this is what basically had his patent granted because it is different. Um, and it's a thermodynamic issue, and we basically look at PV diagrams. So, oh, fucking that didn't work very well, did it? Is that nice and clean? There we go. 
So what we'll do is we'll have a big P here, or gasoline, and then we have diesel here, right? And what we have across the bottom, that's volume, and this is pressure up here, like so. Let me reach. Like that, right? That's a brilliant P, you retard. Okay, Nora. Right. So these PV diagram things, I've done a couple of videos on them. It's quite easy to understand, really. So what happens is... Um, you map out uh, how the engine goes through its cycles. So for thermodynamics, we don't bother with the intake and exhaust stroke, so on and so on. But basically, a petrol or a gas... Oh, for fuck's sake. A petrol... Why has that been gay? Stop it. There we go. That was easy, wasn't it? Why is it... Oh, it's polishing. So a petrol looks like this. Why? So a petrol looks like this, ish. And a diesel looks a bit different. A diesel looks like that. So it looks like one's this has been ro not rotated, rotated and flipped, yeah, all the rest of it. And the difference is, is how these two engines are uh, limited. So what you have with the petrol is you have compression, so that's your compression there. It goes up, then you have basically an ignition point there. The pressure rises to its peak pressure. This is ideal, this is a perfect engine. And then basically what happens is, is that you basically have the power stroke. And what you get out of this is you get work out there, right? So if you look at graphs and areas and stuff, you can calculate the work. We don't really need to do that because the numbers don't really matter. The difference with a diesel is that the ignition happens here. And again, your workout is the kind of the same thing like that. The big difference between the two, the big fundamental difference between the two is how they are restricted. You see, these ignition points are in totally different regions, basically, and the petrol engine is restricted or limited by the fuel you use, right? That's the main thing that limits a petrol. If you have, you know, if you put something really, really volatile in there, just like liquid butane or something stupid like that, something really, really volatile, then you have to lower where this is on the compression, otherwise you'll just get detonation. And the problem is, with detonation, people think, you know, it starts blowing chunks of your piston. It's not just that, is it's when it occurs. If you come up on the compression stroke and it goes bang as it's still on its way up, that can send shockwaves to all the components, jars it, but it can eventually, you know, it's an opposing force. The piston's trying to go up, the crank's trying to turn it and push it up, and then there's an opposing force and it can break things. Horrible, horrible, nasty. The difference with diesel is diesel is restricted by the work in. So this part of the curve here, the compression stroke on a petrol, that is work in. Right, so put work into the system with the engine, the momentum of the crankshaft, the energy that's in the crankshaft is used to compress that cylinder right to this point. Then you ignite the fuel, the, the, the temperature and the pressure rise, and then as the piston goes back down, you can extract work from that. You're turning basically the energy that is heat, you're using that to increase the pressure, and the pressure is a force over a surface area, and it pushes your piston down. And that turns a crank, and that's the work that comes out. So the work that comes out is what we're after. That's what we want. Thank you very much. Um, with a diesel, the way that it's theoretically meant to work is that you are only limited by how much work you put in. So let's just say that all your components are infinitely strong, right? They can take it. It doesn't matter. You could fucking whatever. 
know what I mean? You could have the moon pulling on it and it'd be absolutely fine. It wouldn't shift an inch or anything shit like that. Um, if you had infinite components for both engines, you would still be limited by your detonation, your auto ignition temperature. Um, your yeah, your auto ignition temperature of your fuel. When does it go bang? Because it's all mixed in there. The fuel is in here while you're doing your compression. Diesels, on the other hand, all this compression here, this is just air. And you can compress this to, I don't know, a million to one. You could, you could theoretically compress that to a million to one, but that would require the amount of work to do that. You know what I mean? So a diesel is limited by how much work you put in. Um, and, it, you know, a, a diesel is in a sense self-limiting, apart from all the other mechanical problems like how fast you can pump and stuff like that and how quick you can get volumetric efficiency, how quick you can get air into the cylinder. If all of those were ignored, a diesel would keep on going until the work in equal to work out and then it just hold that revs, you know, hold them revs. All of the other limitations on diesel of how strong your components are and stuff like that, how heavy everything is, it limits the RPM. But theoretically, and this was the big difference, and this was what basically uh, Diesel said against Otto and his mates, was that this is fundamentally different. This system is fuel limited. It is fuel limited. It depends what fuel you use. This is work limited. This is limited by how much you can put in. Now, this is what is generally called a constant pressure engine. Ideally what's meant to happen, and it doesn't, but what ideally is meant to happen is you'll notice that this line here is flat. So the volume is changing, right? So the V here is increasing, but the pressure is remaining still. This, the, the, pressure is, the pressure is constant. And how does that work? Well, you know the pressure rises. In reality, it's hard to do. But what you're meant to do is you add fuel, it burns, and as the piston starts to go down, the pressure will drop because the volume is increasing. But you keep on adding bits and bits and bits and bits of fuel to maintain pressure. What this means is, hopefully, that you could almost have an engine where there's just a continuous equal amount of pressure all the way through the stroke. Instead of like pet petrol engines where they have a peak pressure and then after that, everything expands and the torque falls off, you know, or the pressure in the cylinder falls off, you could have an engine, a diesel engine, where the pressure just c remains constant until you open your exhaust valve and blow it all out. That is the ideal. In reality, the pressure does go up. You know, in reality, these graphs look something like this, and obviously they have the, the backwards and forward strokes. And in reality, you know, this looks like this, where it does all this crazy shit. That's what they look like in reality. And when you look at them in reality, they really aren't that much different. However, even when you take the real world cases of these engines into effect, when you, when you look at real world PV diagrams, when you measure it with a real engine, this engine is still limited by the amount of work you can put in and this engine is limited by the fuel. Doesn't matter if it's ethanol, methanol, whatever. This is always limited by the fuel. Now, you know, people talk about, oh, diesels don't have throttles. Well, some diesels do have throttles, blah, blah, blah. All of those things, they don't require them in a fundamental way, but these are just component changes. You've got to remember, when we're talking about the auto cycle and the diesel cycle and stuff, this doesn't just define your, you know, Ford Focus petrol versus diesel. There's stuff like the Wankel, which again is the auto cycle, even though it doesn't have four strokes. People have got this idea that four strokes means that it's an auto engine. Well, not entirely, because again, the Wankel works on an auto cycle because it basically just has these four cycles that each individual is separated. Two strokes are a bit of a funky thing because it does two at once. So when you look at a two-stroke, it's a bit of a funky thing. A two-stroke, in a sense, is exactly this, just without this bit, without these two strokes of intake and exhaust, stuff like that. We'll go more through PV diagrams. We could talk about adiabatic compression and expansion, and we could talk about isometric um, expansion and volumetric this, that, and the other, and blah, blah, blah. You can just go mental with um, thermodynamics and stuff like that, and the Carnot cycle and all these other things. But, it, yeah, it's a bit... That's the whole point of this channel is to explain all of that fucking, you know, 
rubbish and turn it into things that people can understand and go, ah, that's the difference. And this is why diesels, you know, this is why diesels can have high compression. Can And they can go for the silly compression. It just depends how much work, how much energy that's in the system you want to sacrifice. And there's limits there. The mass of the flywheel and the crankshaft can only store more, so much energy to put the work in. And that's where the work is coming from. The work here is kicked off by a starter motor. And then after that, it is just the energy, the you know, the uh, angular rotational energy. You know, the angular momentum. Just the angular momentum of the crankshaft and the flywheel. Obviously, there's a limit because of their mass. If you have a really light one, then you don't have that much energy. And if you have a really fucking heavy one, then you can go higher and higher compressions. And you've got to remember that diesels are also two strokes. So, you know, this cycle thing, this whole difference between the Otto cycle and the Atkinson cycle and the diesel cycle is basically all about this kind of shite. It's all about the fundamental, um, fundamental cycles is the only way to say it. unfortunately I'm trying to think of a better word you know it's just the the, the real fundamental nitty-gritty of these engines hope that makes sense and I'll see you in a bit